What does the Bible say about feminism? Now, feminism, like systemic racism, though maybe not to the same extent, is a very hot-button topic. There are a number of issues, and particularly as it relates to Christianity, uh, it's something that is quite important for the church to think through and for Christians to think through in particular. And this is because with feminism, there are defining of men's and women's roles, and there is uh, usually... Implicitly, but even probably more often the case uh, with feminism, an explicit denunciation of the principles of Scripture. And uh, pr- particularly as it relates to men's and women's roles, the Bible is said to be oppressive in this regard because it's patriarchal, uh, that sort of thing. So uh, what does the Bible actually teach about this? And how should a Christian respond to feminism? What should be the relationship that a Christian has uh, to feminism? Is the Bible's view oppressive? Uh, and uh, is there something to feminism? So that's that's what we're going to be tackling uh, here with feminism. I plan on doing this in more than one part, uh, but in this first part, the, I, the, the goal will be to give an overview of feminism and then give a brief critique of it. So an important thing to recognize with feminism is uh, that it has been going on for some time. It is a movement that goes all the way back to the 19th century, and there can, of course, be expressions of this in some ways found uh, all throughout history, but in general... When we think of feminism, we think of uh, the movement with that uh, is trying to propel forward women's rights. That's the stated goal and purpose um, that goes back to the 19th century and that was begun uh, essentially in America. Um, so you may be familiar with the different waves of feminism. Feminism is typically described as having three waves. So there's first, second, and third wave feminism. First wave feminism goes from the, the 19th century to about the 1920s and kind of culminates with uh, women's right to vote. Uh, second wave feminism goes from the 1960s to the 1990s and is associated with things like uh, abortion, uh, equal work for equal pay, and uh, divorce for any reason. So those are the, the main things that are associated with second wave feminism. And then in third wave feminism, we, we have that from the 1990s to the, to the present. And in a lot of ways, this is just a continuation of second wave feminism, but with some other uh, more radical ideas. You have a very negative view of, of men in the more radical versions of third wave feminism. You have a greater sexual promiscuity where sexuality becomes a way to empower uh, oneself. This in, in some ways goes back to second wave feminism as well. You had the sexual revolution in the 60s. So some of these things are, again, they're, it's sort of a trajectory. Uh, and then you also had homosexuality, which uh, the idea there is just cutting out men completely. There's no need uh, for men even in a, in a kind of sexual relationship. And so this is the trajectory of first, second, and third wave feminism. Now, one of the things that's common when Christians think about feminism is they say things like, you know, second and third wave feminism are obviously bad. Abortion's wrong. Divorce is wrong. Uh, Third wave feminism is is obviously wrong. Homosexuality is is not right. Um, uh, You know, the the hatred of men is obviously not right. So these more radical forms of feminism... Those are not right. But first wave feminism is not bad because in first wave feminism, women get the right to vote and it shows the equality between men and women. Uh, That's that's a common view of the relationship between uh, the different waves of feminism. Now, one thing that's important to note, though, is that this is actually not quite right historically. Uh, It's not that there is a wedge that is driven between uh, first wave feminism and second and third wave feminism such that they are two complete and distinct movements. Uh, All of the things that flourish in second and third wave feminism find their root and foundation in first wave feminism. And so just as as I mentioned, there's a connection between second and third wave feminism. Second wave feminism really has all the ideas you know, of third wave feminism. They're just developed a bit further in, in uh, third wave feminism. And the same thing is really true with first wave feminism and its relationship to second and third wave feminism, such that uh, really all of feminism uh, is wrong and contrary to the scriptures. And so uh, th- this is the, the this is what I'll be arguing. Uh, how, how is it that we can say that first wave feminism is wrong? As I mentioned, most people with first wave feminism they're really only familiar with the idea of women having the right to vote. Uh, it's very easy to pitch this as being a good thing, and therefore first wave feminism must be good. Uh, but it's important to note what was said about the reason why women are to have the right to vote that the female leaders of uh, first wave feminism use in their argumentation. Uh, for for these women, having the right to vote was a way in which women could ec- have authority and power in the public sphere that they could exercise contrary to their husbands. So the idea is that 
um, you know, it shows there's an, a lack of need to for, to for submission in any sense. Uh, if a husband's doing something to you that you don't like, or if you have the, a, uh, if uh, he is going to has certain views about uh, political power, you can simply subvert him by voting against him. And so the the original goal was uh, to have this huge voting block of, of people of women uh, who would exercise their own power and authority, and they would be able to wield this contrary to men, even contrary to their own husbands. Now this was uh, not realized. Uh, once women were given the right to vote, most women just voted along with their husbands because most people were in good relationships. Uh, but that was the original goal. Th those who were uh, arguing for this in first wave feminism, they they saw the right to vote as the first step of getting women out of the home. And so along with this came then a desire for women to be out of the home. Many of the first wave feminists would describe marriage as a, a slavery, a kind of slavery that they even compared to actual slavery. And they would get themselves involved with the abolition movement and then they would compare the feminist movement with abolition. So uh, women are enslaved to their husbands and that is e equated with uh, uh, actual slavery and women need to be uh, delivered from this kind of slavery. In fact, one uh, feminist in the first wave feminism said that women will never be free. They'll never be free until she has a right to dissolve the marriage bond, uh, basically for any reason. And so this was, was clearly then a, a forerunner of the kinds of arguments that were, were made in second wave feminism with regard uh, to divorce. And uh, many first wave feminists too believe that women should be able to do everything that a man can do, that women did not need the, the protection of men, and that men, basically their headship was uh, completely disregarded and was worthless. And that any kind of expounding of male headship would in fact be, it is in fact slavery. So this is really the view of first wave feminism in terms of what they were after and what they were about. And you can see immediately that it is uh, contrary to the family in really exactly the same ways as second and third wave feminism. And this is really um, a hallmark of feminism. In feminism, there is a denial of the distinctions between men and women wherein women are said that they need to act like men. That's, that's the main idea. And in so doing, there is a devaluing of the women's position and role in the home. That kind of, of role is seen to be not worth uh, very much at all. Now, even if we evaluate first wave feminism with regard to its view of the scriptures, we'll see, see something very similar. Uh, there is quite an antagonistic view towards the scriptures. Uh, the, the first wave feminists were very heterodox and, and heretical. Um, many, uh, uh, many of them held quite strange views on a number of things. But even if we just take the view of uh, men's and women's roles, uh, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, probably the most well-known of the first wave feminists, uh, she actually, uh, along with a number of other female scholars, she was the leader of this, she actually wrote the women's Bible, wherein she literally cut out all the parts of the Bible that were... Uh, advocating a position of patriarchy, a position of male headship uh, within the home. And so she was quite uh, antagonistic towards the scriptures and believed that uh, anything that did not uh, uh, agree with her position on the way in which men and women should relate was evil. And that included then even even the scriptures. We they, uh, Basically, uh, we can get good things from the Bible. She did believe that. So there is, in that sense, a, a modest kind of respect from the Bible. Uh, but it certainly couldn't have been inerrant uh, because uh, it was clearly wrong uh, on men's and women's roles. And those things uh, need to be cut out and they do not need to be uh, listened to at all. And so this is really first wave feminism. And again, it provides the foundation for second and third wave feminism uh, that follows. Uh, now, an important point with regard to uh, evaluating feminism is it's important to note that with feminism, as uh, one author has said, and I do highly recommend this book, it's a book by Zach Garris, Masculine Christianity, he defines feminism as the twisted idea that a woman is free when she is serving her employer, but is a slave when she is serving her family. That, that a woman is free when she's serving her employer, but she is a slave when she's serving her family. And this really gets to the heart of the issue that feminism is contrary to a high view of the family. And insofar as it is that, it is also, it is also contrary to femininity. Uh, if you wanted to ask what is the opposite of feminism, in a lot of ways, it is femininity. That femininity is actually under attack in feminism. And the reason why I say this 
uh, is because the only way in which a woman can find worth or value in her life, according to feminists, is if she acts like a woman. Uh, excuse me, if she acts like a man. It, the only way that she can have a, live a fulfilling life is if she, if she uh, thrusts a slot aside her desires to do things like marry and have children. And she instead acts like a man in the public sphere and in the workplace. That's the only way in which she can live a fulfilling life. But if you're going to say that, then you are actually demeaning. You are demeaning the uh, role of women that, that God has in fact given to her, which is a, a great and highly important thing. And it's something that women actually naturally gravitate to. Many women desire to marry and they desire to have children and to raise children in the home. It's something that is natural and it's God-given. And this is because women were made for this. You think of, a, a, of just even the women's body. Women, a woman's body carries children, uh, gives birth to children, and then even from her body, she even nourishes children, uh, showing that there's this, this clear relationship between uh, the women and the home. And that's exactly what feminists want to get rid of. They want to get rid of femininity. They, they think that even the way in which God has made women uh, is in fact... Uh, inferior in some ways, and that it's only if she, it, it's only if a woman betrays the actual things that God has given to her, the the, the things that, sh that, that she has been given as being made in the image of God, the particular things that makes a woman a woman as distinct from a man, that she actually has to betray those things in order to find fulfillment uh, in life. And so uh, feminism is actually contrary to femininity. And uh, insofar as is the case, then it explains why in, and this is true again, all the way back in first wave feminism. This explains why then in second and third wave feminism, there was a growing uh, relationship between feminism and homosexuality. Because if it's gonna be the case that a woman is always to act like a man, and that all the distinctions between men and women need to be erased, and anything that points to those distinctions needs to be just, just completely excised. If that's going to be the case, then it must also be the case, or at least by implication, that a woman, once she begins to act like a man, would it not be the case if she would begin to desire women like a man? Uh, would that not be the case? And that's in fact what we find. Even transgenderism has a relationship in this way to feminism. Uh, if a woman is to act like a man and all of the distinctions between men and women are to be erased, then why could a woman not identify as a man? If there is no, there's no difference between the two of them, why could she not just identify as one? And so in some ways, even though transgenderism in a lot of ways, undermines the feminist movement. It undermines it because uh, it, it, with feminism, women have to have rights, and in transgenderism, there's no such thing as a woman. Even though it undermines it, it is actually the logical uh, conclusion of feminism. If you take feminism all the way to its conclusion, then there can be no distinction between men and women. And if that's the case, then uh, there's no reason why a woman can't just claim to be uh, a man. And so all these things are contrary to the scriptures. And if I were to summarize the way in which they're contrary to the scriptures, now I've already noted uh, the ways in which it's contrary to the idea of the family, which is clearly a biblical concept. But really, if we were to get to the fundamental issue, the fundamental issue comes, goes all the way back to Genesis chapter 3 and God's curse that he gives to Satan, and then to the woman, and then to the man. But particularly if we zero in on what God said to the woman, he says that there are two things that, that will receive uh, the curse, and that is uh, the woman's relationship to her husband and the woman's relationship to her children through childbearing. Childbearing will become more difficult, but with regard to her relationship with her husband, it is that her desire will be for her husband and he will rule over her. Feminism is simply just the expression of this, that women seek the authority that men have and they seek to usurp that authority and desire it. And that is essentially all that feminism is, the desire to usurp the authority and to be uh, like men, which God had said all the way back in Genesis 3 uh, would, in fact, be uh, what, what women do and is, is part of the curse, is part of the curse. So feminism is contrary to the scriptures. Uh, what, what a Christian needs to understand is that the way in which God has made a, women is not something that women should run away from. It's, in fact, that they sh something that they should be quite proud of and quite happy about. Biblical femininity is a beautiful thing, and it is uh, a really, a, even if you just think about the importance of the role that's been given to women, it is, in fact, quite high. In the 19th century, there was a Presbyterian pastor who said that no society can stand without women, because even though she doesn't make laws, she doesn't lead armies or do any of these kinds of things, she is the one who instructs those who do these things. And if there are not godly women to raise people, then there will be also no godly people uh, in this world. And so the role of the women in the home 
uh, is crucial and important, and feminists deny this to their own detriment. 